Good afternoon, everybody. We are going to start. Uh, the first speaker is Maximino Aldana from the C3 and the Institute of Physical Science at, of UNAM. The title is uh, El Papel del Microbioma en la Evolución. Well, thank you. Thank you all for coming. I know that this is a tough schedule because after lunch, we want to sleep, we want to relax and not to, talk, to hear about the microbiome, stuff like that. Uh, I would like to start with an apology. Uh, the slides are in Spanish because I was told that there are some people in the audience that don't speak uh, English, so the slides are in Spanish. But I am going to talk in English, so that, bear with me, if you don't understand what it is written, I'm going to actually say it uh, out loud. So, my apologies to the people that don't speak English, because I'm speaking in English, and my apologies to the people that don't read Spanish, because the slides are in Spanish. So, the title of the talk is The Role of the Microbiome in Evolution. Uh, this is the work that I've been done in collaboration with Saul Huitzil Juarez, who is my PhD student. He is working at the, Cent at the Institute for Physical Sciences, and also with Alejandro Frank, who is in here, because probably he has heard this talk so many times that he already got bored. And he's a close collaborator, and this is a work in, in collaboration with people also in, the, in Cuernavaca, in the Institute for Physical Sciences, and also here. Some other people have also participated, although, although they are not listed here. Berenice Palacios from the National Institute of Genomics, and Pablo Vinuesa for the Center of Genomic Sciences, and things like that. But, but so let's start. The problem. I am, a, I am a physicist. Actually, I am, I am a theoretician. I am not working with experiments, or actually, I'm not working with bacteria themselves. So, but I got interested in this problem because I do network theory, and, and then I, I saw how to apply network theory to, to the problem I am going to explain to you in a minute. The thing is that we all know now that the human body has about 10 to the 13 bacterial cells. So we are carrying in our bodies 10 to the 13 bacterial cells. This is about the same number of cells than human cells. And in, in terms of genes, we are carrying 100 times more genes of bacteria than on humans. So we are a, we are a bag of bacteria, a walking bag of bacteria, literally. And it happens that these bacteria are not just there doing nothing. They interact very strongly with our uh, metabolism. So if we could see microscopically, we could see this. We would see bacteria in our guts, in our skin, in our brain, in all of our body. And we have uh, many, many of these organisms living with us. We are a complex ecosystem, and these bacteria interact in several different ways with our metabolism. For instance, they participate in the degradation of fat, in the formation of veins, in the development of the immune system, in the biosynthesis of amino acids and vitamins. Uh, they help us to metabolize uh, drugs and so on and so forth. So these bacteria are living there with us and they carry different functions. So it is not that, some years ago, we thought of bacteria like very dangerous bugs who infected us, who produce several diseases, and they do. But very luckily for us, most of the bacteria we live with are harmless. It is not that they are harmless. They help us to do stuff, to interact with with uh, different parts of our metabolism and actually carry different tasks. So the first clues that were published showing that bacteria actually have a very big impact in our metabolism were 
uh, was work by this guy, Peter Turnbaum. This is, uh, as far as I know, probably you know better than me, but as far as I know, the first work showing that bacteria actually interact very strongly with metabolism was done by this guy, Peter Turnbaum. I met him in Harvard, but in those days he was in Washington University. And he published this paper in 2006, in which he presented results of a very neat experiment. So he had to twin mice here, and they killed the microbiome in these two mice with antibiotics. And after that, they inoculate one of the mice with a micro microbiome coming from a fat person. And, and the other one coming from a person, from, from a lean person. Actually, these two people were twins. They were genetically identical. The only difference is that when, uh, uh, during the development, one of those became, became fat and the other was lean. So these two twin mice were infected with two different mi microbiomes coming from two different twins, one obese and the other lean. What happens after that is that the mouse that was infected with the microbiome coming from the fat yeah. guy became fat, became very obese. And the one that, who was infected with the microbiome coming from the lean guy became lean. So he remained. And of course, I have to say that other, other things were equal between these, two, between these two mice. I mean, the food, the, the training, whatever. All the other conditions were the same for the two. The only difference was the microbiome that was implanted at some point. So this was the first experiment showing that um, the microbiome or the microbiota we have in our bodies actually has a profound impact in the development of important phenotypes. After that, uh, it has been thoroughly studied. Now it is, <clears throat> there is no question that the microbiota actually impacts very strongly different phenotypes in our bodies like obesity, diabetes, cancer, even schizophrenia and autism are affected by the type of microbes that we have in our bodies. So <clears throat> different several studies have come up after that showing that the microbiota composition is associated with different phenotypes. For instance, uh, obese people, they have a lot of these, these chap, firmicutes, and lean people, they have a uh, few firmicutes and a lot of bacteroidetes. You can see here in an experiment in which they fit uh, a mouse to become obese, how the population of firmicutes increases as the, as the mouse becomes obese, and the population of bacteroidetes decreases, and the other way around. Now, these fat mice, when, when, the, when the mouse becomes fat, it is put on a diet, and then you can see that these are the weeks after he, it started the diet, that the population of firmicutes decreases and the population of bacteroidetes increases. So the composition of the microbes that we have in our guts strongly determines the, the phenotypes of the, of the host organism. And here there is, a, probably this is not updated, I took it from 2015, but it says that there are about 25 different species in our stomach more than a thousand species of bacteria living in our guts. There are more than, more than 600 species living in our, in our lungs, more than a thousand species of bacteria living in our skin, and so on. So even uh, uh, breast milk has more than 800 uh, species of bacteria in there. So when the mother is feeding the baby, it's passing a lot of bacterial species to the newborn. And <clears throat> the question I would like to answer, well, it's not like I would like to answer, but the question I'm going to work with is, 
what kind of evolutionary mechanisms generate symbiotic relationships between two different organisms? We, when you when you talk to biologists, they always assume that if two organisms are living together, it's because there is a symbiotic relationship between them, because one is profiting from the presence of the other and vice versa. And even though there is uh, particular examples showing these relationships, we do not know the general mechanisms that generate symbiotic, symbiotic relations between two different organisms. So this is the problem I would like to tackle, uh, I would like to address. And to do that, uh, I'm going to use the, the very well-known Kaufman model of genetic network. Kaufman, this is the guy, he invented a model of gene regulation in 1969, I think. He was interested, for some of the reasons he was interested in explaining how the cell differentiates into different tissues. How is it possible that this is, this is the, uh, the egg and then it divides after fecundation, it divides and after a while, at the beginning, all the cells are the same. You can see here the early stages of the embryo and all the cells here are identical, but at some point they start differentiating. They become uh, different. And so the question in those days was, how come if all these cells have the same genetic material, can become different after a while? So he was starting to answer this question. They already knew that the difference between two different cell types, okay, they, they are different in the shapes and the morphology, but the fundamental difference between two different cell types is the functions they carry out. Okay, and the functions are determined by the set of genes that have been expressed in one cell type and the ones that have been expressed in a different cell type. So the fundamental difference from the genetic point of view, these two cells have exactly the same DNA and the difference is not in the DNA, I mean, except by mutations, the difference is in the genes that are being expressed in one cell type and the ones that are expressed in the other cell type. So he came up with the model of genetic network. In, in that time, Kaufman was working with um, random models of genetic networks because he didn't know the topology of any real network. And now I am showing you here the topology of the gene transcription network of this guy, E. coli. This network has been put together for several years by, by the group of Julio Collado, who works in the Center for Genomic Sciences in Cuernavaca. And you can see here the example, a typical example of, what a gen, of how a genetic network looks like. Now, in, in the Kaufman model, he was not interested in the level of gene expression. He was just interested in the state of expression of the gene, whether the gene is expressed or it is not expressed. So in the Kaufman model, he is um, representing the whole genome by a set of variables. Each variable represents a gene, and the gene and this variable can take only two values. Either it is one if the gene is expressed, or it is zero if the gene is not expressed. So this is the, the, the variables. These are the variables that are representing the genes. Each variable is regulated by a bunch of other genes, we know now that these genes interact via uh, transcription factors and small RNAs and whatever. But the thing is that each, the state of each variable is going to be determined by a set of other genes in the network. Actually, this is the same, this is the same network that I showed you before, the E. coli transcription regulation network, but represented in a different way. I like this representation. Let me tell you this, I like this representation because this looks pretty random, right? If I give you this network, but I don't tell you that this is the E. coli network, and I challenge you to tell me whether this network belongs to a real organism, or if I generated this network using one of these algorithms like preferential attachment or whatever, you will be in trouble. 
you will you will be in real trouble because it is not easy to distinguish this network from a random randomly created one so we tend to believe that living organisms are carefully crafted by mother nature or god or evolution or whatever you want to call it but when we see the when, when we see in this way the gene transcription network of real organism can you see any order there can you see any like great design or of course not and actually the guy who who made very famous because he found a way to distinguish to actually tell the difference between this network and one randomly generated in my computer is Uri Alon he is a guy living in Israel and he became famous because he went to the fine details of the motifs that compose it, this network and, he, and then he tell that okay the difference between this network and one that was randomly generated in my computer the difference is not in the global structure, is not in the number of genes, is not in the number of the connections, is in the number of some little motifs like triangles or little all the motifs that are overrepresented in the gene transcription network of real organism with respect to a randomly generated network. But well, in the Kaufman model, when, when Kaufman proposed his model, he didn't know this information, so he assumed a randomly generated network. He said, okay, for me, uh, all, all this network is too complicated, so I'm going to assume that it's, it was randomly generated. And <clears throat> the dynamics of the network is determined by this equation. The value, the state of expression of the gene sigma n at time t plus 1 is going to be determined by the state of expression of its regulators via... Uh, a Boolean function or a regulatory table or, or a regulatory phrase as the biologists want to call it and here is one example of a regulatory phrase for a gene that is regulated by three regulators so let's say that the, the three regulators are on then in that case the regulated gene is also on and for instance, if the first regulator and the third regulator are on, but the second regulator is off, then the gene turns off, and so on. Okay. So this is an example of a gene regulatory network, of a, well, I'm sorry, of a, uh, a Boolean table in this uh, regulatory network, and each gene obeys its own regulatory network, it, its own regulatory function. So each gene is associated with a particular function and in reality these functions for real networks are constructed in a very crafty way uh, here we are going just to assume that these are randomly generated so the dynamics essentially consist in the following each gene at time t looks at the state of expression of its regulators it evaluates the boolean function and then it determines whether it is going to be on or off at the next time step. This is the typical Boolean function model. Uh, <clears throat> so, starting with an initial condition in which this is the, the state of the genome at time zero, this is the initial condition, some of the genes are on, some other genes are off, then when as time goes on, the network changes, changes the state of expression and eventually the system reaches a periodic pattern of expression. This is called an attractor, okay? The same network, starting, starting out from different initial conditions, the same network can reach different attractors, as you can see here. It is the same network. What happens is that we are initiating with a different state, okay? And then the network evolves towards different attractors. And what's the difference between one attractor and another attractor? The difference, as you can see here, is which genes are on and which genes are off. So the, in one attractor, a set of genes are expressed and another set of genes are not expressed, which is different from the set of genes that are expressed and not expressed in a different attractor. But this is precisely the difference between two different cell types, which genes are being expressed and which are not expressed. So Kaufman, came up with this uh, hypothesis that these attractors represent cell types or cell fates or functional states of the cell. So I'm going to skip this. 
So that in the embryo, during the development of the embryo, different cells that are in different parts of the embryo, they are subjected to different chemical gradients, pressure, mechanical forces, whatever. And it is known that even applying mechanical stress to the cell can change the state of expression of the genes. So different cells in different parts of the embryo are Okay, they can start with different initial conditions and those would lead to different attractors and this is the explanation that Kaufman gave to cell differentiation. So the same network with the same genes can differentiate in different cell types because it can reach different attractors. And this hypothesis has been confirmed in a number of different works. Sui Huang, he, he actually he made a continuous model in which he represents all the possible states of the network as a, as a landscape, as an energy landscape, and this minimum are the attractors. So this, I don't want to go into the details, but this model has been corroborated in, in, several, in several organisms. Elena alvarez Buya, to my knowledge, she was the first to apply the Boolean, the Boolean approach, the Kaufman model, to a real organism. Uh, the, the regulatory network of this plant, Arabidopsis thaliana, the regulatory network that determines the appearance of the different organs, the sepals, the carpels, the, <clears throat> the petals. So, and then Sui Huang and Donald, Ilm, Donald Inberg did it for epithelial cells, and then Reka Albert did it for the Drosophila embryo, and then Chao Tang did it for uh, yeast, and so on and so forth. And after that, a lot of papers have appeared showing that the Boolean approach is actually able to capture the main dynamics of gene regulation. And I'd like to, to mention that this model, this particular model, and this is just like a curiosity in, in, this, in this talk, I spent several years analyzing the phase transition in this model, and it happens that there is a phase transition a dynamical phase transition, and I would like to show you very briefly in which cons uh, in what's the, the phase transition. So this is the model. This is the Kaufman network. The genes are here, are like placed like in a microarray, but this is not a microarray, this is my model. There is a network behind these genes. Each little square represents a gene. It is blue if the gene is uh, expressed, and black if it is not expressed. And we can start with an initial condition, and you see how after a while, the system reaches a periodic pattern of expression in which some of the genes keep blinking and some of the genes are frozen. But then I can change the parameters of the network. This is a network in which on average, each gene has two regulators, but then there is a phase in which the system becomes frozen. This is the one. See? Time is going on. As you can see here, time is passing by, but the network is frozen. This is the order regime. Actually, here the network is completely insensitive to perturbations. Let's assume that I perturb one of the genes. Well, not one of the genes, a bunch of the genes, a few of them. These genes, the red ones, have been perturbed. <clears throat> and, and then, which means that in the attractor, I forced some of the genes that were on to be off and vice versa. And then because this perturbation can be transmitted across different genes, the perturbation can either propagate across the entire system or it can die out throughout time. So in the frozen phase, in the order phase, you can see that very rapidly the, per the perturbation disappears. Now let's go to the chaotic phase. And I'm going to perturb Let's say only one gene. Let's see if I can perturb only one. There it is. You see, this is the chaotic phase, and only one of the genes is being perturbed. There is only one red square. And see what happens in the chaotic phase. 
In the chaotic phase, this perturbation very rapidly propagates across the entire network. So, uh, <clears throat> and then there is the critical phase in which the perturbation neither propagates nor dies out. And this is the phase diagram. This is the, this is essentially what we have here is the size of the perturbation as a long time, I, I mean after a after long time. This is the size of the perturbation as a function of the network connectivity, or there is this parameter which people call the network sensitivity. If the network sensitivity is smaller than one, the perturbation die, dies out. And then if it is larger than one, then the perturbation starts to increase. And there is a, a bunch of evidence in which showing that networks of real organisms actually operate here. This is the critical point. And this is a very important point for those of you who don't know what a critical point is, just let me tell you that a couple of people won the Nobel Prize for explaining the properties, the physical properties of the syst of systems operating here in the critical point. This is a very special point. But this is not the main topic of my, of my talk. So what I would like to do is to, to use these networks, to train these networks to perform a task. What happened? <clears throat> I would like to train these networks to do something. Okay? So this is the Kaufman network. This, these are the genes. And I'm going to train the net, this network to, to do something. We, since very long time ago, since Hopfield, probably we know how to train networks neural networks to recognize images, to recognize sound, to do different stuff. Actually, now we have neural networks that can compose music, that can beat uh, this Jeopardy contest, can beat humans in the Jeopardy contest. So we know how to train networks since long time ago, but all the network training, or, or most of the network training, have been done with neural networks. And I'm going to train genetic networks, which are quite different from neural, from neural networks. So what I am going to do is to choose a subset of nodes here, these green ones, and to ask and to record the signal that is coming out from this subset of nodes. And in this particular case, the signal is just the sum of the states of the nodes in this set. And I could like this signal to, to behave in some particular way, like, for instance, here. This is the target function. This is what I would like the signal to, to look like. Of course, if this is a random network, at the beginning, the signal is not going to look anywhere close to the, uh, to the, to the target signal. So, so the signal that I get is like this blue one, R of T, while Whereas the, the signal that I would like the network to have is T of T, okay? So what I, what, I, what I am going to do is to train the network so as to learn how to reproduce the target signal. This is what I would like the network to do. And the, the training is, is a very standard one. This is a very standard training. There are not too many things that we can do to a network. We can rewire input connections or output connections, or we can change the Boolean functions, or we can change some of the input connections or output connections. So this is a, just a simple uh, genetic algorithm to train the network to do uh -huh. something. Uh, and the fitness parameter is going to be the error, the quadratic error between the signal that is being delivered by the network and the target function, I mean the signal that I would like the network to deliver. So this is an example. I start with the random network. Here you can see the signal the, the, in green and the target function in blue at the beginning of the simulation. And after the training, you can see here the signal and the target function, and you can see how the network actually learns how to reproduce the, the target function. 
So what I am doing is a population genetics algorithm, nothing creative here. It's the standard algorithm. I start with a bunch of networks, with a population of networks. And here I measure the error, I mean the distance from the distance between the signal and the target function. And this is the error code. Red means a lot of error and blue and, and white means uh, uh, no error. So I start with a population in which all the, all the networks are red because none of them can actually realize, can actually perform the function. Uh, just by chance, some of the networks in the initial population perform the function better than others. So I order the population from the larger to the smaller error. I remove the networks with the larger error and keep the ones with the smaller error, and then I replicate those. And I repeat this process over and over until the population is trained to learn the task. And this is related by the fact that the error becomes <clears throat> every time bluer and then whiter. <clears throat> this is a, I don't know if this is the, yeah, here's the video. Well, the simulation. So let me explain. This is the network, the original network. Here, you can see here, you can see in white, this is the target function. And in green, this is the signal that is actually coming out from the network. And they don't look, they don't resemble. And I'm going to train the network to do the task. <clears throat> so the network is mutating. Some of connections appear, some of the connections disappear. But then overall, you can see how the signal actually approaches the target function eventually. And here you can see the evolution of the error throughout generations. This is the error between the signal and the target function. And you can see how the error decreases, decreases a lot. Until it crosses this threshold that I am going to call the adaptability threshold. And when it crosses the threshold, is because the error between the signal and the target function is less than one. Okay. And then I would say that when the, when the error crosses this threshold, the network is well trained. It's already well adapted to do the task. You can see here in these parameters that the mutation the, the number of mutations accumulated by the network to actually perform the task is 44. And it took more or less 400 generations to decrease the error below this adaptability threshold. We can consider this as a human trying to adapt to a new task. And I'm going to call the I'm going to call this the human network. Just, this is just terminology, okay? Don't be mad at me. <clears throat> so this is the human network, or the host network, if you want. What I'm going to do now here, there is this, this is the plot in the population, how the error decreases throughout generations. And it takes about 400, or probably more than that, 450 on average to actually cross the adaptability threshold. Now, I'm, I'm going to do the same, but I'm going to, to let the human network interact with a bacterial network, which is a similar one, but the bacterial network has a larger mutation rate. This is the difference. The difference between the human network and the bacterial network is in the mutation rate and also in the, in the reproduction rate. So, the bacteria mutates 10 times faster and reproduces 10 times faster than the human network. And there is another difference. When I start the training of the human network, the bacteria is already trained. The bacterial network is already trained. You can see here, I don't know if you can see here at the bottom, this is the difference between the signal, the bacterial signal and the target function for the bacteria, for, for, for the bacterium. And you can see here, that the, 
that the bacteria, the bacterium, the bacterial network is already well trained, whereas the human network is not. Okay, so I'm going to let these two networks interact. There you go. They are interacting. That means that some regulatory connections can come from the bacterial network towards the human network and vice versa. Here you can see how the, the error in the human network decreases. Here. The error in the human network decreases, but also the error in the bacterial network decreases. That's because I am in each generation, I am minimizing the the error of the entire system. Okay. Now it happens that in this case, the number of mutations in the human network to actually perform the task is only 14, not 40 as before. Whereas the mutations in the bacterial network is 111. So this shows you that in order for the human network to perform the task, whatever it is, it has to mutate less than if it was doing it by itself. And that the, the network that is actually mutating is the bacterial network. Actually, the, ne the bacterial network is the one that is doing all the adaptive work. Most of the adaptive work is being done by the bacterial network. And the training is way faster. You can see here how in only, in less than 100 generations, the error in, in the human network actually goes below this adaptability threshold. These are the same results. Here is the, the average error in the population. The, the green curve corresponds to the case in which the human network is evolving by itself with it, without the help of any bacterial network. The blue network shows the error in the case in which the human network is evolving with the help of the bacterial network. And here the number of mutations accumulated for the human network itself alone and, and for the system of human network plus bacterial network. And this is the probability of being below the adaptability threshold. So at the beginning, the probability of being below the adaptability threshold is zero. And why it is zero? Because none of the networks is trained yet. But then, as the generations go by, you can see that in the case in which the human network is evolving by itself without the help of the bacterial network, it takes a long time, actually, to reach a, a, a considerable fraction of the population below the adaptability threshold, whereas when it is held by the bacterial network, it immediately, almost immediately in 200, in 200 generations reaches a, a plateau in which all the population is below the, the adaptability threshold. So this is the effect of interacting with this other network in performing the task. And this is the average error in, in the bacterial network it already started below one, but actually go further down. So it becomes better and better in the task that the bacterial network uh, does. Uh, and now we were wondering what happens if we disconnect, once these networks are trained, what happens if we disconnect them? It's like once we have E. coli in our guts, we remove them, I mean, by, by taking antibiotics or whatever, so we remove them from our, our guts. Or if we take one of these bugs and try to cultivate it outside the human body. So once we have this relationship, these interactions between the human network and the, uh, and the bacterial network, we are going to cut off all these links. And you can see that when they are interacting, both of them are well adapted to their, to their respective tasks. Now, when we cut the links between these two, something very interesting happens. Let me show you. And, and this was a surprise. We didn't expect this. This is the initial error 
in the human network, which was, which is large because the human network is not trained, and the bacterial network, which is low because the network already started training. Okay. After 500 generations, the error in both the human network and the bacterial network actually become smaller. They, they go very, very small. And then they are already trained, and then we disconnect them. I was expected the human network to, to have a large error because the network was trained in the presence of the bacterial network to perform the task. Okay, so if I remove the bacterial network, then the network, the, the human network is not going to, to be able to perform the task. But the bacterial network was already trained. At the beginning of the simulation, the bacterial network already was doing, it was already very well adapted. Okay, but here what, what happens is that when we disconnect them, neither of them, nor the neither the, the human network nor the bacterial network can perform the task. So we are seeing here the emergence of a symbiotic relationship between two different networks, okay? Even though one of them already was functional at the beginning of the simulation, already was very well adapted. After this coevolution, they became interdependent. They depend on each other to to actually perform their respective tasks. And this is very well known. We, we already know that changes in the composition of the microbiota, either because we eat antibiotics or whatever other reasons, produce uh, dysbiosis, I mean, dysfunctions, malfunctioning in the human body. And we also know that it is not possible to cultivate bacteria that live in one uh, environment. They cannot just take them out of this environment and cultivate it by, by themselves. So they, they need the, the niche to the entire ecosystem to actually be able to survive. Then we did the same. I'm going to flash on these results. We did the same by adding, this is the human network, and, and then we add two bacterial networks just to see, just to see if this is a, Adding more bacterial networks will help the human network to reach the task faster and more efficiently, and the answer is no. This is the result. The red curve is the error in the training or in the adaptation when the human network is evolving alone. Then we have the blue curve when it is evolving with the help of one bacterial network, and the green curve is when it is evolving with the help of two bacterial networks. And you see that there is no much benefit in having one or two bacterial networks. Actually, we, we, we found, it says here, that two networks helping do not improve the adaptation of the human network. Actually, things are worse. If we add more and more networks to help the human network, the adaptation becomes worse and worse. Here we have the human network evolving by itself, then with one bacterial network helping, then with two bacterial networks, and then with 10 bacterial networks. And you see that the error becomes larger with 10 bacterial networks. So too much hands trying to help doing a task actually interfere. Okay. Okay, thank you. I will finish in 20. <laughs> <laughs> so much help actually worsens the adaptation. See? And this is against this, this huge diversity that we see in the microbiome. We know that we have thousands of species, different species living in our bodies. So how come? It was a little bit frustrating until there is this idea. Well, it, there was this observation. I don't remember who made this observation, but probably it was Saul, who said, okay, but it, it happens that the human network is not performing just one task. It has to perform several tasks, okay? 
So we, we have a multitasking network. So what happens if we ask the network now to perform, depending on the initial condition, to perform task number one, or to perform task number two, or to perform task number three, and so on. What happens is now, if now we have to train the network to perform different tasks, depending on the initial condition. Now, probably the addition of more bacterial networks would be beneficial, okay? And there are two different ways in which we can add different bacterial networks to help the human network to perform different tasks. One is the unspecialized interaction in which all the networks try to help in all of the tasks, okay? And the other is the specialized interaction in which one network is trying to help in only one task, okay? So we have the human network. The human network has to perform, has to be trained to perform 10 different tasks. And we have these two different schemes, special, unspecialized, in which all the networks try to help in all the tasks, and specialized, in which only one task is being uh, held by one uh, bacterial network. And here are the results. The results here. This is the unspecialized interaction in which everybody tries to help with everybody else. So remember, the human network has to perform 10 different tasks. And here we are trying to train the net this network in the absence of bacterial networks or with only one bacterial network trying to help or with two bacterial networks and so on with 10 bacterial networks. And you see how the more networks we add to help the human network, the worse the adaptation, okay? This is the unspecialized case. And this is the specialized case. So now each network is helping only with one task. Here we have the human network trying to perform the 10 different tasks in the absence of any bacterial networks and then one bacterial network, two bacterial networks, and ten bacterial networks, and you can see here how the more networks we add, the better. So, we are seeing here not only the emergence of symbiotic relationships when we try to, to, to train a network to adapt or to perform a given task, but we are also seeing the emergence of specialization. In, in the different bacterial networks. And, and this was also my, I was really happy with the result. What is lacking here is interaction between these bacterial networks, because we know that there are synergistic and antagonistic interactions, so we still have to introduce uh, these synergistic and antagonistic interactions. And so far, I'm going to finish right now, well, in two minutes, uh, let me take up two minutes of your time. So, so far we are trained these networks to perform arbitrary tasks. Okay? So we impose those tasks uh, in a random way. Uh, well, this is the conclusions, but I already said what I wanted to say about this. So, <clears throat> what about if the task is more complex? If it is not just like a random function over there that we want to fit? Now the task is to reproduce a sequence of musical notes, like in a melody, okay? So we can binarize uh, the chords or, or the musical notes. For instance, this is uh, the piano, and when I play a chord, I am going to represent with a one the note that is being played, and with a zero, the notes that are not being played, okay? And, and so I can generate here my sequence of zeros and ones, my binary sequence. And then this is the music sheet. And as the music goes on, we have a series of binary sequences. For instance, here I have to these notes played, which corresponds to these ones here, and all the other notes are not played. So we have zeros and so on and so forth. So we can make a correspondence between uh, a melody and the dynamical trajectory of a network, okay? I don't know what, is, what this network is, 
But there must be a network somewhere that can reproduce this trajectory which corresponds to this melody. And there must be a network that should be able to play Bach, another network that should be able to play Mozart, or to play Stravinsky, or to play whatever, right? So there must be a network out there. You just have to find it. And this is an example. So after the training, this is using this algorithm of training, this is the network, the Boolean network that plays this music. So, and now, this is like a curiosity, right? But then, and I'm going to finish up with this, if the creation of music represents cognitive processes, the way in which the brain works, then we can map these cognitive processes into the dynamics of one of these networks. And I told you before that these networks may, may be in a phase transition, okay, maybe in a different regimes, in different... So, this is, to my knowledge, the first opportunity that we have to actually measure the dynamical regime in which these cognitive processes are operating. Like, actually have a quantitative measurement. I would bet that probably reggaeton is in the frozen regime, because you don't, you don't need neurons to actually listen to that music. The good music, whatever it is, should be somewhere around the critical point, and then like the decaphonic music or more complicated music should be like in the chaotic spectrum. So, but this is the this is like the first time, to my knowledge, in which we can actually measure the dynamical regimes in which cognitive processes are. And I would thank you for your attention. <laughs>